Hello everyone and welcome to episode six of Teach Me Bridge. Um, I'll be your host tonight, uh, Adam Brooks is my name. Uh, in a moment I'll introduce the other members who are uh, going to present tonight, but before we do that I'm just going to pop on my slides here and if I can work out what I'm doing, it's always good when you're live and trying to work things out. There we go. Fantastic. All right. So we have got some wonderful guests for you tonight, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, so uh, all of our videos are up on the YouTube channel, and you can follow us um, if you uh, search for Teach Meet uh, or TMWA Reach. You'll find our YouTube channel there, and you can follow us so you don't miss another video in the future. Um, if you've got any questions, um, we use Twitter. So um, if you use the hashtag TMWA Reach, you can ask one of our guests or one of us uh, a question, and uh, we'll pass those questions on to them after they've presented. Um, and I guess the objective of TMWA Reach uh, to begin with was that, um, that we all feel connected in this broad state of ours, no matter where you're situated. And this episode in particular is about um, discovering innovative ideas to use in the classroom and also to learn what it means and how to be innovative. So uh, I'll pass you on to our guests and uh, they can introduce themselves. So first of all, I'm going to um, pass you on to Bruce. So there you go, Bruce. Are you there, Bruce? Yep, all good. Sorry about that. The uh, mouse is on the other screen. So I'm Bruce Feuder. I'm, I, I'm over here from um, Canberra. So I, it's 10 o'clock over here for me. You guys are a little bit earlier than me as far as the time goes. But um, I'm going to be coming over that way next week, actually, for a, a series of um, professional development sessions. Over here in Canberra, I am... Um, I'm currently working for the Australian Computing Academy, but prior to that, I was an associate principal at Gungahlin College, and that's a government year 11 and 12 senior college um, here in Canberra. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit tonight about the approach that we've used to make sure that students in year 11 and 12 can access a curriculum that is um, truly personalized, that gives them an opportunity to explore the things that they wanna explore and that isn't restricted by um, timetabling issues or, or you know, it's class numbers, those kinds of things. So the curriculum's a little bit different over here. We have uh, one IT course that has something like 15 to 20 different individual semester long units in it. So it's a little bit different to the way that things are structured over there under the SCASA curriculum. But uh, you do have two different courses, and one thing that I know happens in some schools over here, and is probably the case in regional schools over there, is that you don't get enough students interested in both courses to run both classes. And I guess one of the things that um, we found with our students is that we weren't able to give everyone the class that they wanted within the traditional structures of the line-based timetable. So what we do now is we offer IT at any time. It, the, the students can do it whenever they like. They can access the material for it's concurrently at any time online, and they can sequence them in any order they like so that they can uh, study the, the individual units that they want to study. So I guess in, in your situation, at least in your 11 and 12, you could do this by offering both the applied IT and the computer science course in the same class uh, or, you know, to any student in the school that wanted to do it, it would be two different courses running concurrently then. The way we do it is we use our uh, online management system, a learning management system to um, advertise all of, the, all of the course materials. We don't restrict access to students other than to say, if you're studying IT, you can see everything and we provide all of that weeks, two weeks in advance so that students can see the content that's coming up. And rather than 
scheduling an individual teacher for you know a specific lesson or line on the timetable what we do is we we spread the teachers out across the week so that we all see every student at some point during the during the timetable and that gives us an opportunity to make sure that we can all touch base with them that they can access the individual expertise that we all have and they can ask questions about the aspects of the uh, curriculum that they're interested in to um to the to the teacher that they feel most comfortable talking with them about and the result is that we offer about six or seven concurrent units of IT at any one time we uh, assess all of those units through the ACT uh, curriculum requirements so that's a uh, tests and assignments each semester and at the end of it all students have completed an IT course that they wanted to do rather than one that was restricted by the uh, the timetabling structures at the school it works really well it's something that I think would work um, it would be very ideal actually with the uh, the digital technologies curriculum in years 9 and 10 in particular where you've got an opportunity there to give students some project experience to explore topics and uh, aspects of IT that they want to explore within the, the confines of the curriculum and it's one of the things that I'd really like to, to talk to you guys about when I come over there uh, during during those events so um, I'll, I'll be there for, for a good week or so um, uh, in WA and I know Bavneet's advertised on the TMWA page different times that we're going to be around and uh, I'm, I'd love to chat to more of you to, to give you a sense of how things work get into some of the nuts and bolts and find a little bit more about the types of things that you're dealing with at your school so that we can um, I can share that experience and maybe come up with ways that you could implement or, or, or um, adopt some of those approaches in your classes. I think it's a, it's a really exciting. As a result, we've um, grown our IT enrollments. We now run eight classes, which is every line of the timetable. So students can access IT teachers and IT classes any time of the day, any day of the week um, through the traditional timetable. And they can also access it after hours and at any time. So it's, um, it's a great way, I think, of making sure that your subject is accessible to any student and to give them a little bit more say in what it is that they're going to learn. So that's me, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone else has got to say. Thanks a lot, Bruce. Um, I, I really like that idea, and I've used it somewhat within my own classroom, but not to that extent. So it really inspired me to um, change things up within my own school. Thanks. Um, what I'll do is I'll now introduce, um, well, John Townley. Uh, John's going to uh, be speaking to us uh, about let me get this right. Um, job flip and authentic learning. So I'll pass you on to John. He can um, introduce himself and the school that he goes to. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm teaching at Sis Landrews uh, Senior High School in um, Perth, and I was at Armadale Senior High School. So I've been teaching in the city of Armadale now for nearly 15 years. Um, uh, we're quite a low socioeconomic area, so we are working hard to find innovative solutions to engage students and keep students engaged and um, you know, interested in uh, being at school in some cases, um, which is really good. Uh, it, it's a, a, an inspiring time to be um, a teacher, particularly at our school. We're doing um, project-based learning across our curriculum across the timetable rather for all students, which is uh, proving to be a really great kind of experiment from a number of angles. Um, I've been teaching for quite a long time um, and I've taught remote and district high schools um, and a little bit of primary and quite a lot of secondary, mostly IT in the last 15 years or so. Um, I got, I became interested in the, the um, the idea that um, students might be interested in um, getting involved in what I do on a daily basis, um, primarily for selfish reasons. You know, I, I sort of acknowledge that we have a very stressful kind of job. Um, can, I, can I share my screen at this point? Is that doable? I think so. Hang on. Yes, you can. If you click on the green button at the top, you'll be yep. able to share your screen. No worries. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I kind of 
with PBL evolving within the school and its kind of natural focus on student-centred learning, um, it, it struck me whilst talking to another colleague about this who'd been doing similar stuff in his classroom and school down at Trinity College, um, that there is actually a whole bunch of stuff that we do every day that our students could do for us, <laughs> which it seems funny, but um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense when you actually think about that. Primary schools and high schools seem to be, mostly primary schools really, seem to be doing all kinds of interesting um, activities, getting kids busy doing things all around the school that are sort of above and beyond or sit within or alongside the curriculum content, all these kinds of programs and groups and mentoring and helping and stuff that goes on. Um, and I sort of, you know, I, I was thinking a little bit about how do you assess that. So this year um, we're actually trying to assess some of that activity with their general capabilities. And when you kind of look at the general capabilities and the traditional kinds of activities that kids do in, in schools, it seems to be a little bit sort of hit or miss whether they're actually, um, you know, hitting on these things. So personal, social, critical, creative thinking, you, you're probably going to get that out of kids doing the kinds of things that we do every day and running around doing organisational activities and working together in teams and solving problems. But once you start to sort of look at the others, you get a kind of maybe, uh, depending on the kind of activity they're doing. They might be doing that or they might not be. So teachers are, the other thing that struck me is that um, teachers are stressed. It's fairly obvious that, you know, there's study after study coming out about how stressed we are because of all of these things that we have to do. You'll notice teachings on the end there. Um, so, you know, what happens is the question of, I'm asking and trying to do uh, in my classroom at the moment, and we are experimenting with bits of this across our PBL program across the school, is which bits of our job can be done by students and is that a useful idea anyway? Um, I think it is useful if we look at the general capabilities and the core skills framework. So the Australian core skills framework, which you can access uh, here, um, and the skills clusters kind of illustrate it pretty well. Um, I'll just zoom that in a bit. So yeah, I mean, even in primary school, I think it's incumbent on us all to consider uh, the world of work. And um, traditionally, I suppose it's been the job of high schools to do that, but. Yeah, looking at these, you kind of think, okay, when you have kids running around the school just doing all kinds of organisational things and or within the classroom, they really are doing a lot of these things. So there's another framework there that we can use to kind of assess um, and, uh, you know, understand what they're actually learning when they're doing that. Um, so what does it look like? It prob probably looks like PBL a lot, um, students researching and preparing lesson resources, which is one of the interesting, really interesting angles on this. Um, students writing their own assessments, another really interesting one. And students forming teams, managing resources, rosters, budgets, and you can start to see how literacy and numeracy can be impacted, whoops, by those kinds of activities. Um, yeah, so is it worth doing? Well, yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, yeah, I think it is, and it's probably quite difficult to do. It is proving to be quite difficult for me to get students, you know, engaged in, in that kind of stuff, but collaborative learning and project-based learning and getting students busy doing things is always difficult anyway. Um, I think the benefits possibly could outweigh the challenges and we'll, we'll see how we go. I think it definitely suits digital natives and 21st century learners, this kind of activity. Um, simply because, you know, they, they do um, come to every activity with the implicit assumption that they can find out how to do things generally by using the internet. So the resources that we're leveraging, GAFE, um, Google Apps for Education for, you know, students to be able to share stuff and Google Sites so they can share what they're doing and use organisational tools, um, Trello, things like that um, for project planning. Um, yeah, and pretty much everything else we use. One thing that we're going to definitely be doing this year and we're working on at the moment is self-assessment rubrics. So students can tell us when they're demonstrating particular skills, which raises the spectre of um, students re reading the curriculum, really. Um, so some interesting ideas around that. You know, why can't students design their own tests? Well, 
the answers aren't secrets generally to tests. Um, and the, uh, that idea demands, it does demand a kind of Socratic method, students really digging down into understanding uh, or posing questions is, is clearly a powerful thing that we, we all do um, quite often as teachers with, with kids. Um, yeah, so it's so kind of a bit of a flip in the, in, in the sense of flipping who's responsible for what. Um, and yeah, an observation, wouldn't it be great if the curriculum was actually written so eight-year-olds could read it? But, yeah, um, anyway, uh, how many questions do I answer in a day? Well, yeah, probably as many sets as as, um, uh, as you'd find on a pedometer if you've been had a busy day. So, uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if, if we were asking, answering a lot of those with, yeah, that's a great question. Um, why don't you go and ask the person who knows the answer? And that person is a student. Um, well, I, I, sort of having a look at innovation, I like this person, Stephen Shapiro's whoops, definition of innovation um, because uh, the relevance is, is the part that captures my attention and the fact that we are in a time of unprecedented change. So we do need to, to think right outside the square. And, you know, I, I love the idea, the ideas I just heard about timetables and students being able to access what they want to learn, which is... Um, yeah, truly student-centred. So, okay, so it, it's just something I'm up to at the moment. So, thank you. Cool. Um, thank you very much there, John. Uh, it inspired me with some, some great ideas for the project-based learning that we're going to be trying at um, our school this year. So, um, I'm going to steal some of your ideas there. I really like the, um, the concept of the um, core skills framework um, as a as a way of um, assessing students as well. That's a, a great idea. Uh, I'm now gonna pass you on to uh, Hannah. Uh, Hannah's gonna be talking about um, flip learning. Uh, she's an expert in this field and um, she's going to give you some ideas on how you can be innovative, um, particularly in the early childhood years. So I'll pass you on to Hannah. I uh, can't hear you, Hannah. My microphone on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, all good. Okay. So, hi, I'm Hannah Dodds. I am a primary school teacher and I'm not too far from John, actually. Um, I'm over in Harrisdale Primary School and I live just down the road from Cecil Andrews, so I keep having a sneak peek at what's happening there with your STEM building. Um, I'm also the digital technologies leader at my school. So last year and this year, we've been uh, leading some strategies to get staff using some innovative things in their classrooms as well. So tonight I'm going to talk about that and also just talk about flipped learning, uh, what it is a little bit and just my journey of how I've done that in primary schools. So I'll just uh, screen share for a second. Here we go. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen. Cool. All right, so um, what is flipped learning? Basically, flipped learning talks about um, utilising and making use of videos, screencasts, voice recordings and other different um, tools online to make the best use of your class time. And also, um, nowadays, uh, there's such different abilities of students within classrooms, different interests, and um, the pace of learning is very different amongst primary students especially. So it's just catering for all of those things and hopefully um, improving engagement for students. So basically, um, in 2015, I went to the Flipped Learning Conference and it really inspired me to give it a go in my classroom. So I came back and I was actually working up in the Pilbara at that point. And I started quite simply uh, with a non-research-based task, non-academic, and we just did flipped Father's Day cards to begin with because um, I was just trialling the management of how I would flip my classroom and also just giving it a go and seeing if the students were capable themselves of um, managing their own learning because they were quite young at that point in time. Um, so reflecting back on that, it was really good to start with something simple like that because uh, just as primary school teachers do literacy and numeracy centres sometimes or rotations, I had to train them up on what they were expected to do within that space. 
Um, and then we started to move toward, so I had a blog and I posted a lot of uh, things before lessons on there just to get them inspired and also posting afterwards as well so they could revisit the task or um, practice it for homework with their parents. And it really broke down the walls of the classroom, allowing parents to really interact with their child. Um, and we did have a one-to-one -one iPad environment up at South Newman Primary School, so we were quite lucky that students also took their devices home and could share the learning that they were doing with their parents. So we then moved on uh, and we started actually doing academic based things with the flipped learning. So I started to develop videos. Um, we did things like uh, structure of writing, um, sentence structures. We had kids who were working towards simple sentences versus some uh, working toward paragraphing so um, just catering for all of those needs was something that I was doing with making these different videos. We then moved into doing uh, differentiated maths instruction um, and just being able to break apart and get kids of all different levels working at their own pace, working at their own level and then I would bring them back together at the end just to cooperate and uh, talk to their peers about what they'd learnt for that session. Uh, we also did a few information reports. So this was more so catering, I suppose, for student interest. So making a playlist of all different animals. Um, I recorded myself instructing them on how to write an information text as well. And then they um, had to go through Book Creator and answer questions throughout their tasks um, just to keep that accountability level up. So last year I had a pre-primary class and we did flip learning again, but it was a little bit different because uh, the students were so young um, in pre-primary, entering in some of them were still four years old. So it was more so on group stations that they were doing flipped learning. And we also had um, about 10 iPads per class. So it had to happen in more of a small group setting. Uh, so basically they would, for instance, uh, scan a QR code and link through to the sight words they were focusing on. Um, and they were all at different levels. Again, some of them were pre-readers, unable to read at that point. Some were whizzing through and um, quite capable with reading. So even at that young age, we were able to cater for those differences um, in their learning styles and also where they were at. Um, so that's another, just an example of some small group learning. I also um, recorded myself reading to students and they were able to read along with their text and just follow through um, and practice their reading strategies as well. Um, so I'll skip through. This year I have year four fives and obviously being week five of uh, term one, we haven't quite got into flipped learning just yet because a lot of um, things have been around assessment and getting to know each other and things like that. But um, one tool that I've used and found really great for what we will be doing later down the track is Seesaw. So uh, one thing we've done already is I just pre-record or take a photo, set them a task and they're able to respond at their own pace. And um, I've started playing around with setting different groups, different tasks. So that tool of using Seesaw has been fantastic in um, being able to manage flipped learning in the classroom. So I highly recommend Seesaw. Um, so just regarding the structure of how a flipped lesson works, Generally, you would have an intro body conclusion in your lesson and flipped learning, I suppose, just allows for a lot more differentiation, students working at their own pace and also the interest level, as I spoke about before. Um, when I've started to, when I first started flipped learning, um, I had to really explicitly plan because I had to think about the tools that I was using, how I was going to manage the class. And so um, I will pop these slides on after. This is linked to a pro forma of how I just planned for my first set of flipped lessons. Um, obviously now I'm a bit more familiar with it. I feel more confident just popping it in my daily work pad. Um, but initially I did have to explicitly plan what I was doing. Uh, that's just another picture which I'll pop online after this. Um, so in making flipped videos, you do have to think about um, where you're storing them, where students are accessing those. Um, so as I said, Seesaw has been awesome this year, especially in a primary setting. But there's other tools like Google Drive, uh, you might use YouTube, lots of different platforms that you can explore. Um, and also, sorry, for making videos, I usually use Explain Everything or just the general um, 
videoing of reading and things like that as well. Um, with Seesaw, you can do things like screencasting within the app. So that's been a very useful tool as well. Uh, that's just an example, we'll skip through that. So I've spoken about Seesaw and you can go on seesaw.me to find a little bit more information about how that all works. Um, but basically the teacher can post things out to students or um, the whole class and get them to complete some tasks. So it's a really great app to use. Um, also within a primary setting, it's really important to obviously think about social skill building and things. So um, students aren't just working on a video um, in an isolated fashion. Um, I'm really trying to make sure I'm embedding uh, cooperative learning within that, um, either in the plenary of my lesson or hook of my lesson, and also in between just to check that students are accountable as well. So um, I do use a lot of Kagan cooperative learning and uh, the book 59 Kagan Structures has been quite useful in helping me to um, implement that in my classroom. Um, and just lastly, before I pass you back to Adam, uh, just regarding leadership at my school, being the digital technologies leader um, and just trying to ensure there's um, other people becoming uh, involved and being excited about innovation in their classrooms. Uh, we are setting Seesaw as a whole school um, app and workflow solution for everyone to use. Um, so we do lots of things like appy hours to support our staff, professional learning um, every couple of Wednesdays and things like that to um, try and ensure that innovation is spreading across the whole school. And we're trying to use a shared leadership model. So basically anyone attending those appy hours and professional learning are trying to use it within their classroom and then they share back to staff. So we've started something called a Tech Termly. It initially was a magazine where I would just showcase um, different staff members and what they were doing in their classrooms. And I'm hoping that that kind of evolves into being a little bit more of videoing, um, maybe some screencasting and things as the year goes on, just to share back what people are doing in their classrooms because there's some really great innovation happening across our school. Um, and that is pretty much it for tonight. And I'll just leave with a little quote before I pass back. Uh, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. So um, if you're out there listening to um, all of these presentations and you're getting really excited to innovate, just give it a go and um, yeah, build the new within your school. And I'm sure others will begin to get excited for it as well. So thanks, Adam. I'll pass back to you. Cheers. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, you always inspire me with all the stuff that you're doing um, at oh, your school. You. <laughs> and I really like that. It, it goes along with the, the Teach Me WA motto, which is be the change. And I think that last quote that you put up just um, summarises what innovation is, is all about. It's, it's about getting out there and, and trying something new. So thank you for that. Thanks, Adam. Cheers. Um, I'm going to present to you guys now about um, something innovative that I've um, started up at uh, my own school, which is uh, Colby Catholic College in Perth. Um, it's called Project 2030, and I'm just going to show you a bit of the, the concept um, slides that I put together for the principal. Um, so I'm just going to screen share. Entire screen and... All right, fantastic. So um, Project 2030 was an idea that I came up with um, with uh, another member of my department. And um, it basically focused on this idea of, well, how do we prepare students for the world that lies ahead? And um, I have a lot of um, pains at um, the amount of effort that we put into content and um, and content is readily available 24-7 to our students. So what are we doing to prepare them with skills, you know, the things that aren't going to change? Um, I love this quote, um, schooling is a 12-year course on how to be a shit robot. And um, as I say, I presented this to my, my principal and the, um, the director of innovation and uh, a bit taken aback by this quote, but um, it, it really is. Robots in the future are going to be able to um, give you content, whatever you need um, at your will, whereas we need to be teaching students the, um, the skills. So that was my focus with this project. So this came out um, 
in October last year, a couple of months before I presented this, and it's um, that we need to focus on the things that machines will be less good at for longer. And so um, things like um, creative skills uh, and um, things that require human emotion. And, um, and these are the, um, the skills that robots won't be able to perform, at least in the, um, in the upcoming future. So um, anything that um, there's some inputs that can go in and there's a, uh, an output that can come out of the end, we're not just talking about, um, uh, you know, um, unskilled labour. Things like law, for example, where if we can give a machine a whole bunch of evidence and um, we, we won't require lawyers anymore, we can just pump out a result at the end um, that can determine your case. So there's some thoughts. So don't go committing any crimes in the near future. Um, so as I said, the focus here is on skills. So things like critical thinking, grit, um, developing empathy, problem solving, collaboration, innovation, um, and particularly like entrepreneurial skills um, and, and that creativity. So when we were, we were um, talking about a new strategic plan for the school, and these are the things that everyone was talking about wanting to include, and the issue kept coming back to, but what about the content? What about the content? And, and so with this project, my, um, my uh, thought process is, well, let's not worry so much about the content if we can focus on these kind of unchanging skills. And we, it doesn't mean that we um, forget about the content altogether, but um, the skills become our focus and that's the things that we assess on. Um, so that's, um, that was the thought behind this project. Um, so uh, a few people out in Teach Meet World would have seen this video most likely to succeed. If you haven't, make sure the next time there's a viewing, and I think um, Buff Meet's trying to organise um, a school to host one in the near future. It's about a school Adam, called High Tech Home. Sorry, yes? sorry to interrupt you. I think your screen isn't presenting. So if you oh, just put really? that on. Yeah, have no. thanks just messaging through. So All right. sorry to interrupt you there. <laughs> no worries at all. All right. So um, with High Tech High, um, it's a school, uh, well, there's a number of schools now in the US, but originally in um, California, and um, they do project-based learning as their, um, for everything they learn. So the big focus is on skills, and um, they cover about 40 um, to 50% of the, the, the content of the, the whole curriculum. Um, so I, I like this idea of rewarding the innovative and punishing the, um, the formulaic. So um, kind of flipping things on, on its head. Um, so how do we bring all of this together? And this was my, my thoughts as I was, I was going through it. Well, we need something that's underlying, particularly in the high school context where we've got, um, we've got these subject silos and, um, you know, how do we bring the school to work together uh, on, on these skills and, um, and perhaps on, on a project as well? So um, I um, suggested that perhaps we could use the... United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals. So these were some goals that were set up, um, uh, that they've been going for a while, but they've been reviewed quite, quite recently in the last couple of years. And the idea is that these are the goals that we reached for, um, for 2030, and hence the name Project 2030. So there's 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the, um, things like ending poverty, um, uh, water access for, for all, um, gen gender equality, um, just to name a few. And so the idea was if we could have an underlying theme for each year level, um, so an underlying sustainable development goal for our year eights, and our year eights would then focus on um, one of these sustainable development goals in um, across all of their subject areas. And uh, by having this underlying theme, it kind of then brings the departments together to, to work on, well, how could we help the year eights meet this goal? So um, by having this theme there, it was almost like we could bring all the departments together to work towards one goal and then start thinking about, well, how do we work in a cross-curricular fashion? Um, 
So that's what I was just explaining there. So having these focus projects where students had to try and do something to help the world reach this goal. Um, so it's really authentic learning, um, focus on the skills and not the content, but the content could be underlying um, those choices that we make. Um, so yeah, all of these things, across curricular learning, skills over content, authentic and engaging, rethinking pedagogy and, and helping students prepare for their future. Um, so we should be immersing students in, in beauty and inspiring um, them with the world that's around them. So this is one of those, um, those, those things that can make that happen. So um, this year, uh, our goal is we, we've got one set of year eights. Um, we've picked um, some um, heads of learning area that um, have supported our process. And we've got um, one representative um, one RE teacher, one science teacher, and one HAS teacher, and they're sharing that same set of, of year eights. And this was a, a way of, um, rather than kind of making, you know, this uh, broadly across year seven, eight, and nine, all sets, um, we could start small and, and trial it out and iron out the creases and, uh, and give things a go. And if they fall flat in the head, then so be it. We can, um, we can retry in a different fashion. And um, with uh, this is actually now in term two now. So what we ended up deciding to do was using the 21st century um, skills framework, um, focus on the skills in term one, because perhaps um, the students will require some training in, um, in the skills that are required for project-based learning. So rather than kind of jumping straight into it, actually explicitly teaching those skills. So. Um, each term, um, the three teachers have kind of divided up and they're focusing on two of those skills in their, their own classroom and doing some explicit instruction in, in those skills. And then at the end of term two, we've got a four week block um, where we've got one project that's fo focused on those sustainable development goals. Um, so one of those sustainable development goals. And it's got a little bit of content perhaps from one or two or even three of those learning areas. So we haven't and decided on what this project is at the moment, um, but we've got a fair idea of, um, of where we're kind of heading with it. And um, so that's about it. I'm going to um, unshare my screen now. So, and I'll invite the others to, um, to join us. Um, so the Project 2030 idea is, is one way in which I've um, I guess our schools try to um, re-look at how we do schooling altogether, and and I've been so grateful to have um, such a supportive administration team and um, supportive hollers who are, have taken this project on board, and some amazing teachers in um, Emma Edmonds, um, Stephen Gardner, and Shelley Alexander. So um, they're they're trialling this out. I don't know where it's going uh, at as of yet, um, but they're actually using Seesaw as a, um, as a reflection tool through that as well. So um, the students are really, really excited about it and I'm really excited to, uh, that it's kind of come to life and uh, I look forward to telling you more about it in the near future. So it's very exciting, Adam. And geez, I think thanks. you're getting the stepping stones happening to really like change and innovate across your whole school. So well done, it's very inspiring. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank Bruce and and John for joining us. And I hope Bruce can um, get some sleep now. It's, it's <laughs> nearly 11 o'clock your time. Yeah, thank yeah, I've got a little you. bit of extra work to do, but I thought I'd drop in and say good day to everyone before I head over. So Yeah, looking forward to catching up. And if there are any um, inspiring digital technologies leaders within schools, um, and would like to meet Bruce, there's a post on the Facebook page um, to, I guess, register your interest and, and catch up with Bruce in person. And thank you, John, as well. You are more than welcome. Thanks heaps for that, Adam. Um, I've been working with the UN Sustainability Goals and Digital Portfolios with students doing project-based learning in my classroom for about a year. So it's really inspiring to hear somebody else explaining how it can be implemented across a school in a really clever way. Thank you. 
that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I'll have to catch up with you more. I'm, I'm really excited about your STEM space. I need to come and see it. Yeah, it is. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and thanks, as always, Hannah. Um, you're a great sport, and um, hopefully you haven't run out of too much credit with your no, phone data. No, <laughs> my data is still going, thankfully. So thanks right. as well to you, Adam, for hosting today. And no worries. I'm excited to do another Teach Me Reach session, hopefully before the end of the term. Like yes. We might be able to have one. Cool. Yeah, so All what right. we'll do is we'll canvas some ideas about um, what you guys want to hear about next. And um, we'll let you know when the next Teach Me Reach is going to be soon. So thank you, everyone. And uh, if you've missed this episode, you can catch us on YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel afterwards. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks.